Thank you, Lord, for a chance to come together. And we want to commit this evening to you. We want to thank you, Lord, for Chris's willingness to come and to share tonight. And as we've said at each one of these workshops, Lord, we do want to learn to be better at what we do for your glory, Lord, and with a heart attitude that brings you glory. Mm. And so from that right heart, Lord, we come and we want to be better at what we do. We want to learn and we uh, invite your presence with us tonight. In your name, amen. 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 Awesome. Um, So yeah, hi, my name's Chris. Um, I've been playing guitar for probably 12, 13 years now, kind of as a punk 13-year-old teenage kid, just playing rock and roll. Uh, not in the basement, we didn't have a basement. But, um, yeah, like Joel said, I went and studied jazz at university and um, kind of grew up in church life. My parents are both pastors and went to uni to study jazz, finished my jazz degree and then realised nobody kind of listens to jazz. So in terms of, uh, you know, if you want to make a career out of it, you either have to be on the level of the greatest of all time or you have to play something else. Um, and so now a lot of the work that I do, like studio work and, and performing, is a lot of pop. It's a lot of rock stuff, covers, stuff that people want to hear. Um, but also playing in, in church. And so, um, yeah, I probably started playing in church at, I don't know, age 13, 14. And then a couple of years later, someone was stupid enough to put a microphone in front of me. And that's how you fall into worship leading. <laughs> and so as a worship leader, I, I have a bit of an interesting perspective because uh, I'm one of the few worship leaders that just loves electric guitar and is telling the guitarists to turn their amps oh, yeah. up. No, it's good. It's Amen. good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. And so... Um, just play it loud. Just play it loud. Just turn it up. Just turn it up. But I guess I'm hoping that today will be helpful if you play electric, if you play acoustic. Obviously, a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about are covering both instruments and even bass a little bit, you know, if, if you play a bit of bass. Um, you should all have, yeah, a handout. And if you have a look at that front page, you'll very quickly learn that I'm a guitarist and I went to uni for guitar, not graphic design. So please forgive me if it's just a bit cluttered and a bit gross. And yeah, just jump in with questions when you can. Spooky chair. <laughs> so let's discuss. Just, just first, throw some ideas at, at me. What is the role of a guitarist at church? It doesn't have to be electric, doesn't have to be acoustic. Who's got some thoughts? When we come and we're we're with a band, let's say, like a normal Sunday morning, you've got drums, you've got bass, you've got keyboard, like what's our role? Any thoughts? Help fill in the sound? Yeah, cool. To bring the anointing. (laughs) (laughs) To bring the fire (laughs) going. Holy Ghost. Yeah, brilliant. Anyone else? To cover the kind of mid to high sort of frequency. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Depending on which and when. Yeah, good answer. I guess, yeah, in that sense, you've got all spectrums because if you're including all guitars, if you've still got bass, then yeah, you've yeah. electric going right up the top, so you've got that whole range. You've got the whole thing body, really, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yep, yep, the body. tags and riffs, so in the lead vocals and the instrumental. Yeah, the yep. Stages, no, awesome, awesome. Um, maybe for acoustic more and more, you sort of hear the tone of the guitar less and it also almost becomes like a strumming percussive sort of yeah thing. amen uh, brother yep in those instrument. in those big sections of songs it's just like a glorified tambourine really. yeah it's, just kind of, uh, it's totally like shakery tambourine yeah, yeah. you yeah. just want the flick of the yeah. that's all you the... that's all you want if you can tell what notes they're playing out of front of house then <laughs> yeah. you're just doing it wrong <laughs> yeah doing it wrong. <laughs> Funny. yeah cool great answers great answers um i guess that that acoustic guitar thing is great in a in a big mix where everything's full and then having the ability for your, for your front of house guys to just pull out a little bit of acoustic in the softer moments is just yeah. the dream. Um, it r- happens rarer than I, I wish but those Sunday mornings when I'm not on the platform with our worship team and we come into a still moment and then all of a sudden the acoustic guitar jumps out it's like oh. <laughs> there's, there's a presence. Yeah. <laughs> I was distracted up until then but there it is. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, so I guess the way that um, the handout is, is, is structured is it's just kind of like four or five questions that we often ask as guitarists, or that we should ask if we're not asking, to help us, uh, I guess, operate really better in, in bands, or even by ourselves if we're um, just supporting a worship leader. 
Obviously, our focus as guitarists shifts depending on the context and depending on the people that you've got around you. If you've got a keys player or not, if you are on electric and you've got an acoustic player or not, if you are just on electric and there's no acoustic player, and so we'll kind of dive into that a little bit, because if your worship team is anything like ours, we sometimes have two electrics and an acoustic, we sometimes have one electric and nothing. Sometimes we just have acoustic and no electrics. And so how we shape our role and the, the content that we're producing, for want of better words, what we're playing, um, to fit what else is going on in the band. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess it's a really difficult thing to, to define. But everything that you've said is, is, is so true. And so let's just look at a couple of quick things when playing as the sole electric guitarist, which happens a lot for us. Does it kind of happen a lot for you guys? Like you just have one yeah. electric guitarist oh, on a Sunday? Or... Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, Oh, so, I can't remember a time when we've had two electric okay, guitars. Other than recording. Other than recording. Yeah. So when we did some live recordings, yeah, cool. we had acoustic and yeah. two electrics, yeah. which then you had the luxury of a, basically a rhythm guitarist and a lead guitarist. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but for the most part, these it's guys... It's one electric and one acoustic, or just one electric, pretty much. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 yeah, cool. Any worship leaders leading off electrics at all? I've done that. When required. Sometimes. Yeah. Those Sunday mornings when everybody's away, just like <laughs> down the coast. You're like, I guess I've got to lead up electric. <laughs> Shred. Yeah. yeah, cool. So some, some thoughts in terms of like when playing as the sole electric player. We'll start there. And obviously if you only play acoustic, don't worry, like we'll get there. Hang on there. Try not to fall asleep. Um, main thing, like you said, to cover those key phrases and those, those key lines. And I would, I would define anything that's like a key hook or a phrase as something that jumps out of... Uh, out of the mix of a song, if you're listening to the original recording, that you don't have to go searching for with your ear. Yeah. You know how like you learn some guitar lines off a YouTube video, and then you listen to the actual song, and you're like, it's there somewhere. Mm -hmm. I can't really hear it, but it's mm -hmm. there somewhere, I'm sure, because I watched him play it on YouTube. <laughs> um, but, but, but when you're playing as just the sole electric guitarist, those are like chief concerns. Because if they're not there, sometimes it can be more distracting <laughs> because often people are waiting, waiting for them for or it. expecting them yeah. and then all of a sudden the whole church is like, oh, let's look at, at the guitarist because it's Lion and the Lamb and he's not doing... <laughs> like the whole band has dropped out and there's just nothing, <laughs> right? And it's just like, you know... We have actually had that moment. Really? Yeah. Oh, true. That That's the prophetic gift of my life. So, um. <laughs> so yeah, so step, step one, playing, playing your key lines. Yeah. But often they're coming, uh, it's rare for them to come when, when there are vocals. And so those times when the worship leader is singing and we want to support them, sometimes there's lines we can play. But otherwise, one, one thing that I really love to do as a single electric guitarist is to imitate two, or to pretend to have two electric guitarists. And I've written, if you have a look at the notes, um, just a, a simple idea, and there's a lot of ways that you can do it. But, but um, sometimes you rock up to church, and, and uh, I've been guilty of this growing up. Uh, we'll use, let's, let's use Lion and the Lamp because we're talking about it. I'm the sole electric guitarist on a Sunday morning, and I come and I take my big old bar chord that I've been practicing for six weeks, you know, and I'm. Our God is lion, the lion of like there's just massive shapes, right? Yeah. I've just bought a distortion pedal because I finally got enough pocket money to. So I'm doing this. Yeah, just just muddy and and gross and your front of house guy's got his think fingers in his ears and it's just it's not a good time um and that is and that is fairly hard to do anything with for it to really yeah, kind of yeah. make a contribution because a couple of our guys here like tony and michael and a, a few of us also do front of house as well okay cool and yeah. if we had to choose between that and an acoustic guitar <laughs> we'd pick an acoustic guitar every time in terms of actually really contributing something yeah do yeah you know what i mean totally totally so the, the shapes that I've written there is, is literally just taking that idea, put your hand up in the air if you can play a bar chord. Yeah, cool, cool. Most, most people. It's, it's just taking that idea, but taking two notes out of it. We've got the low root note and a finger on the third. Yeah. OK? 
okay? Chords are made up of one, three, and five. Maybe you know that, hopefully you do. Uh, and so our, our index finger is often on the low root note and middle finger on, on the third. So instead of using a, a whole bar chord like this, we're just taking two notes out of it. Yeah, index finger, middle finger on the G. And that, you've got this low, chunky, fat bottom sound, and you've got this high thing. It sounds more like two guitarists working together. It fills out a lot more room in a usable way, rather than just... Like that's just that's just mess. Um, you use some effects with that, and all of a sudden you've got a way more usable tone. Uh, if we're around here, right, it 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 fits way better than if I was playing operating in such a huge tonal yeah. space. And so when you're the single electric guitarist, my priority is always cover the key line and then in big sections, imitate two guitarists because we want it to be, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the down sections, then the question is simply, do I drop out or do I play something quiet or non-distracting? Non we'll talk more about that um, Chris, later question. on. The notation yeah. underneath the tab there. Yeah. The little squiggles, what does that mean? That's just a, a rhythm sign for an eighth note. Yeah, it's not really important, just the, the shape is important. I think I probably just had the eighth note selected when I drew them up. Do you guys all understand how it's notated? I went with tab because we're guitarists. <laughs> we can't read Does anyone too. not read tab or does anyone not? Uh, I'm more used to. Nice! Or, or used to treble clef. Because well, I learnt flute for like seven years. Yeah, nice. <laughs> okay, yeah, totally. And yeah. Howard? Or Mate, I, I just take chords. That's, that's it. Yeah, yeah cool. cool. Fine. Cool. No worries. Do you want to talk just for a minute or two about tab? Yeah, for sure. Um, tab just demonstrates the six strings of the guitar. The low E string is at the bottom. Okay. And the high E string is at the top. Mm -hmm. So if you actually hold the guitar up, it's notated differently to how we would see it on, on the neck. The idea is the low E string is down the bottom and the high E string is up the top, right? It's yeah. opposite. Yeah. But that's to keep it in line with traditional music notation where the low notes are at the bottom and the yeah. high notes are at the top. Yeah. So if you have a pen handy, you can just write from the bottom up E, A, D, G, B, E to give you a sense. And then the numbers just refer to what frets you're playing. So there, three on the low E string and four on the G string, or, or the notes G and B, you just play like this. Yeah. Index finger, third fret. Yeah. And it's just the two notes out of the bar chord, but I'm ditching everything else except these two. And it just sounds way, way better. A little bit of restraint. Eventually, it's the third in the octave above. Yeah, is it, it is. Always, or is it? Or is that just that? that you can that play the third down the octave. Yeah, it's just a, it's a little bit lower, a little bit grungier, a little bit closer together, yeah. and so it doesn't quite replicate that two guitar feel. Um, there's a song off the new Bethel record, "Raise a Hallelujah." Have you heard that song? Good song. Yeah, and it uses that that idea, one and the third directly next to it. Like, bit of delay. Yeah, but it's a different sound to all of a sudden there's, totally. there's more width there. Yeah, so those four voicings just demonstrate um, the major shape and then next to it the minor shape with the low E string root. So that's here and the minor. Yeah, we can play the minor with different fingers if you want, third fret and third fret. And then the next two in the same space are just based off your A-shaped bar chords. Please stop me if you have any questions. Or if you're like, we get it Chris, move on. They'll let me know as well. Yeah? I, I think most of our guys here would be playing a root and a tenth at some point, whether they know yeah. it or not. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Great. And then you're muting all the rest of the strings with your left yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm actually using my index finger. To, to stop all the other strings from ringing out. If I'm not doing that, it just sounds it just sounds messy again. So I'm I'm using my index finger 
to, to cover those other strings. And similarly, with these A shapes, or shapes with the root note off the A string, I'm doing the same thing with my index finger, but you'll notice that on my index finger, I'm actually fretting on the A string a little bit higher up so that it's muting this low E string. If I had just fretted normally, I've got a low E string in my chord. So that's something you can practice at home if you want to. That low E string isn't doing anything. But that, that's generally um, the thought process as the sole electric guitarist. Then you make changes based on, okay, who else is in the band? What are they doing? Do we have a keys player? Okay, what are they playing? Am I taking up a lot of their territory? If they're playing a melodic thing, I'm going to play a chordal thing. If they're playing a chordal thing, maybe I'm going to try a melodic thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Doing something different, any mix engineer will tell you, don't just don't have two people doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's why one person plays bass and one person plays drums and we play guitar. Um, and then, I don't know if you ever have auxiliary instruments, do you have strings or... Nah, cool, then we don't have to talk about it. When you say melodic, you're yeah. talking about uh, like arpeggios just plucking... Yeah, yeah. yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll talk more about that later on. Later on. It is, it is, like, practically, I think it is really important, isn't it, for the electric guitarist to try to stay out of the same octave as the keys play. Totally. So uh, one of you needs to make a choice to either go up or down and to stay. Because yeah. I know when we're on sound often, it's virtually impossible if the electric guitar is in a similar register, similar octave yeah. to the keys, yeah. to make both of those speak at the same time. Yeah, it's totally. It's basically impossible. Yeah. So yeah. try and keep out of each other's octave. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And that, that can be something that you can talk about in your rehearsals. Um, but it can also be something that you are listening for. And when you hear them higher up, you retreat lower. Or if you hear them lower, you, you kind of move up. Mm. And so getting your guitar vocabulary and your fretboard knowledge up is really going to help with that. Mm. Any questions before we move on? Nah, cool. In the rare cases, if you have another electric guitarist, then the conversation change, changes. Um, learn not to overplay is the very first thing that I wrote. Like, okay, do I need to play right now? <laughs> it's a hilarious question. Um, yes. but, but like, do, just do I need to play? Sometimes yes, yeah sure. Sometimes, actually I'm going to serve the song more and our worship leader more and God better if I'm not playing. And it takes a, a bit of humility to go, actually no, this moment doesn't need me. As much as I'd like to think it does, God's moving and this doesn't need my sick shredding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, conversations like what frequencies am I occupying? What is the other guitarist doing? Similar to what we discussed with the keys. If you've got one guitarist up here, then this is going to work well. But if you're both up here and playing slightly different things, it's just going to sound bad. <laughs> Where is the song sitting dynamically? And then, yeah, always try and do something different and complementary. So different rhythmically, maybe chordal versus melodic. Tonally, if you talk to any sound engineer, if you have two electric guitars that sound identical, it's just not a good time. So maybe using a different guitar each, different gear, different levels of drive. We'll talk all about that later and in different octaves. I would just be able to flesh out just a little bit what you mean by where is the song sitting dynamically, as in kind of in the progression of big to small? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, so dy dynamics, quiet, yeah. loud. Often, you know, if the song's firing, then we want to use two guitars playing. But if it's soft, both guitarists don't need to be, for example, like we love swells as guitarists because I, I, I don't know. If you're anything like me, you're just like, I'm 16, I bought a lot of pedals. So yeah, yeah. I've got a volume pedal, and so I'm going to, you know, just because it's a lot of fun. But two guitarists both doing that, picking different notes. Like, you know, one person comes in on this, and the other person's coming in on this, and then all of a sudden you have like a great. You know, <laughs> just kind of ringing out. It's like, Whoa! Either one of them would have been fine, but exactly. both. Um, yeah. So in the softer sections, yeah. yeah. And it can be something you discuss, but it can also be something that you begin to listen for and learn. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions from anyone? No. Nah, cool. Awesome. If I'm going too slow, or if I'm not taking enough time, just let me know because it's difficult knowing what no, to cater to everybody. Cool.
So, so Chris, are there are there circumstances where you're on electric guitar mm. and you are playing all six strings of the guitar at the same time? It's or, yeah. Go, or, sorry. or would it be more like either two or three strings of the guitar? At the yeah, time? yeah. It's it's generally two two or three strings. It's very rare for me to be, you know, even if I'm playing something chordal like. You know, it's 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 taken up a lot of room there. So instead, if I am going to be using a lot of strings, I'll be picking through stuff. You know, something like that. You know, big wall of sound. I mean, it can be can be great in a moment if you're doing like a big old crash chorus on like eighth notes. Ja ja yeah. ja. What's that song? Pieces by Bethel. Yeah, da, da, you know, yeah. like okay, sure. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I and wish I had more strings. Yeah, there. like the back three rows are all head, head banging. Yeah, like none of this is an overarching, the only way. It's just some thoughts, and there are always exceptions yeah. to the to the rule, but, but very rarely. But in general, though, it'd be fair to say that that would be a point of difference between the way that the acoustic guitar would normally be played in worship music yeah. versus the way the electric guitar. Would be. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Because, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of thoughts as to, to as to why, but generally you can't hear the acoustic guitar out of front of the house <laughs> in big sections, so it doesn't matter if it's not. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah, yeah, really good, really good thoughts, really good points. Oftentimes, though, if I am going to be playing big chords, I, I'll still sneakily be muting a couple of strings. Like, if we're in G... Sorry, the volume's here. Like, I'm muting the A string there. Yeah. You know, just to try and get some clarity. We'll talk more about clarity later in time. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Sweet. Question number two. How can our guitar tone help in achieving these goals? And so you'll see that I've actually got a couple of columns to talk about based on electric and acoustic. All the acoustic players go, woohoo! Uh, but here's some thoughts that can apply to both of the guitars and indeed the bass guitar. These topics aren't the popular ones to talk about when you show up to a church and do a guitar workshop because you can't fix them with money. <laughs> Just being totally honest. I'm only saying it because I'm buying that guy. something new, you mean? Yeah, you know, like, like I've got to buy the guitar, I've got to buy the pedal, it's going to fix all my issues, I'm going to sound great. But these two things, if you don't have them working, no amount of gear is going to help you out. The first one is sensitivity of your fretting hand touch. I originally had your left hand touch, but then I thought, okay, if we've got some left handed guitarists, I need to be left inclusive. Um, that is not a politically charged statement. So left hand is, is the one fretting the guitar for me because I'm right handed, but, but learning to fret well seems like the most, like, like, you know, the most basic thing that we learn when we're playing Smoke on the Water for the first time. Um, but it's hugely important. Yeah, too little pressure on your left yeah. hand. Totally. You know, your notes are weak. Yeah. Totally. Too much pressure on your left hand, and you're bending the note out of tune. Have you ever Have you ever played and you're like, oh, okay, my guitar's in tune. Yep, yep, yep. D major chord. Oh man. Like, oh, I can... Always sharp. Always. Especially Not if always. you've come from an acoustic, especially if you've come from 11s or 12s on an acoustic. Yeah, you go to where... totally, totally. Yeah, but acoustic, that's really important, thicker, thicker strings. And so practicing, and I, I, I would sit there with the tuner on at points, picking out individual notes of my chords, going, am I bending these sharp? Cool. I'll, I'll give you an example, right? So there's a D chord. But if I push down really, really hard, Ooh, could yeah. you hear just how... Yeah? particularly prominent on those lower string notes as, as well, right? And you're still on the, th I'm on the, the third, same fret. The third fret. I'm on the third fret, but I'm pushing harder with my index finger. And um, if you were to watch the tuner, it sounds like I'm, I'm going up a semitone. Almost a G sharp. Oh, we can turn a song. <laughs> It probably already is a song. Um, <laughs> some guitarists that can't play. Um, so learning your, your left hand fretting and just, just, you know, considering it. It seems like the most obvious thing, but it's not until someone goes, 
hey, have a think about your left hand fretting. You go, oh my goodness, like I'm just playing everything sharp. Or I'm, I'm not pushing enough, particularly on acoustic guitar, but everything is, is muted and I've got muted, muted notes. And or, so. or buzzy too. Or buzzy, yeah, yeah. 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 And that's um, a lifelong journey, avoiding the buzz. A lifelong journey on guitar. Mm. So that's, that's fretting hand touch. But then also you've got your strumming or your picking hand touch. And one of the things that I am so often guilty of is I come from a jazz degree where everything is speedy and quick and light and on its feet, right? So we're playing... <laughs> Right? All that kind of stuff. And I, I come into church and it's like, come on church, let's praise God. <laughs> I don't know why that's my go-to song for today. <laughs> Someone better tell me what that is. Right? But, but my, my tendency, at least historically, was to be very light on with my right hand picking attack. Just because whatever you practice, whatever you work at, that's what you get better and that becomes your habit. And I had to learn in talking with other guitarists who I kind of admired and respected a lot in the, the church space or in the rock space, that notes feel different when you dig in with that right right hand. Um, I mean, I could give you a church example and a non-church example, just so you can hear the, the, the difference, right? That line in the lamb riff that we were talking about. Let me turn everything on. <laughs> so I'll play it there. Cool, that's around there. Don't judge me on my tempos. Um, right? If I play that softly, right? Right? Totally different feel, totally different meaning, right, compared to if I'm playing... Gonna wake up everybody when they roll in the front door, and the other ones, you know, gotta send it's them just to, totally to sleep. Different attitude, it's it? such a different attitude, really particularly is. those two note voicings that we were looking at. They they feel so different if you dig into them, right? Like this is yeah. no pedals. Yeah, versus you know. So, so right hand attack on, on acoustic guitar, obviously we have finger picking as well and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But, okay, with both of these concepts, left hand and right hand, what's God doing in the moment? Where is the song at? And how can I adjust both of these things to, to serve that moment? I will say the only thing you shouldn't adjust is uh, to serve the moment is that D chord out of tune. <laughs> Real sharp. If God taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, look, I want you to play sharp the whole song, <laughs> maybe that's not him. Anyway, <laughs> could be, could be. So, so what about when you get tense if you're playing? Like, surely the tendency is to then start fretting too hard with your left hand? Yeah. Or maybe yep. to go over and start hitting the guitar too hard with your right hand. So yeah. is that just a matter of playing practicing mm -hmm. just yeah. getting more comfortable in your own skin when you're playing for the for the electric guitarists what strings do you use just throw some numbers out at me nine oh, ten, 10 to 46 10 to 46 yeah. yeah 10 46 i don't know is is a perfectly reasonable answer yeah 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 cool tens are great um i love on my electric guitars for church playing 11 to 49 just because I play acoustic a lot, I play electric a lot, and then jumping between the two of them, it isn't as big of a, a step. And I, I find with 11s on top, you get extra sustain out of, the, mm. out of the higher notes that I would lose on 10s and 9s. I've often heard people say, men play 10s. Like, yeah, you know. But ultimately, it's not necessarily about what string gauge you use, but familiarity and, and listening well. Yeah. You can play 9s and sound like an absolute beast yeah. with sustain if your technique's good yeah. if you're paying attention to it so it's about just being conscious of it and starting to listen starting to listen to it yeah we might chat a little bit about strings now it'll be real it'll be real good it'll be a real good time <laughs> talking about strings just guitar things yeah um yeah we don't really need to talk about strumming hand attack i love john mayer 
Any John Mayer fans? Yeah, a little bit, right? Right, like you heard this riff. And that is a total different jam to if I'm digging in with that right hand, just emotively. One makes me want to dance, one makes me want to just, you know, Observe. sip a nice glass of chilled sparkling water in a bar. <laughs> it's a bit sneaky. Right. But but it's just it's just you know and that's no, I'm not I'm not hitting any buttons it's just it's just there it's just yeah, my fingers. Yeah, one's in a mosh pit the other one's in an island. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and sometimes the moment is island, you know. But but it's just a good thing to consider. Cool. Let's talk a couple of electric and acoustic things to to look at, and I could talk to you about this for literally hours, but I won't. Electric. Obviously, what kind of pickups are you using? If you're using single coils or humbuckers, or something in between, you know, TV Jones, or um, P90s, or whatever. It's going to change your sound. Just, just things that you can experiment with. This is a Strat. Um, I have fallen in love with the Strat in recent years. Growing up, my first ever electric guitar was a Strat, and I hated it because it had this awful single coil buzz. I was like, nah, Strats suck. I never want to use a Strat ever again. So I bought humbucker guitars. I've got a Gibson SG. I was like, now nah, cool. Now I've hit the big times. And in the last, I don't know, six or seven years, I've gone, actually, no, I love single coils for quiet parts, for clean parts, for not shredding. And this is a cool axe because you have two singles and a, and a humbucker. But obviously, your pickup selection is going to play a big old part in your guitar. Whether your guitar has a trem arm, which this gu guitar does for, for vibrato parts, whether it's slightly, slightly hollow, um, it's all going to make a difference to your tone. Amp. Obviously, we've got a great amp. Yeah. <laughs> go vision. Go vision. <laughs> Hand wired Vox. None of this PCB business. Right. Get out of here. <laughs> Only the best for Jesus. <laughs> um, choosing a good amp is a great starting point, and well done. You've done it. So <laughs> we don't need yep. to talk about that anymore. And then, obviously, how you, how you mic it or how you get it to front of house. And that's, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty great. You can talk to Joel if you want a lesson on that. He's, he's all over it. He's all over it. Uh, and, and the volume that you're setting the amp, which isn't a, an issue here because you've managed to capture it at a loud volume, which is awesome, really, really quietly. Um, but for electric guitar tone, I love that edge of breakup sound, which you have probably heard electric guitarists the phrase before. Where if I play softly, it's clean, right? But by digging in some more, I've got grit there. And if I, if I go to the humbucker, I've got a lot of drive. And so it allows me to change the sound of the guitar without touching anything here. So in that case, is that drive just coming from the amp? It's just coming from the amp, yeah. And it's so, amps are wonderfully touch sensitive. So if I'm... It's different. Over. Yeah. So, nice job. Strings, we already talked about strings a little bit. 11 to 49s I love, but I mean, you can sound good on anything. But for, for me, um, they, for church playing, just sustain so well in the, top, in the top end, which you don't get. And often you can get 11s with way chunkier lower strings, and then they end up just sounding muddy and gross. So like for me, 11 to 49s is a healthy balance, but for you, how you play is gonna affect that. And obviously acoustics, it's another conversation for me. From there, I actually have just started running tens. So while I am a firm advocate of the elevens, I love being able to slide and bend around, particularly in non-church playing, which is a little harder to do the thicker you you get. You know, um, it's, it's you know it's really it's really great to have elevens, but if you can't bend up to the note you're looking for and you're constantly flat, you know, I'm trying to hit here and I'm, <laughs> you know. Or up to, you know, being able to bend three frets, I like for my solo playing. Mm -hmm. So does everyone, does, everyone, does everyone get that? That obviously a lighter gauge of string is going to be easier for bending. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But generally that a heavier gauge of string is going to be a little bit better for intonating the guitar, so keeping your notes yep. dead totally. on. So you just got to find that sweet spot for you. And in church playing, in general, I guess it's fair to say that there's not much string bending. 
<laughs> there isn't. There isn't. Do, do we kind of agree with that? Yeah, totally. Uh, whereas if you went out and played a blues gig, then you're really going to need to. You don't play any notes that aren't bent. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to bend every single note. Yeah, that, that's right. So. Like, why do I play this note when I can play <laughs> that one? How often would you change better. your strings? Your um, I, so, so just to give you some context, I, I play once or twice a week, um, like cover gigs. We're playing for four or five hours. I'm in a suit, you know, or a corporate thing, and I'm just dripping in sweat. <laughs> and so I change my strings probably like once every two weeks. Yeah. Um, I buy a big old pack of the strings that I want off eBay, I buy like 30 sets of strings for 100 bucks. I'm like, yeah. And literally every two weeks, just, yeah. just restring it. You're going to need to change it probably a little bit less if you're not playing as frequently and if you're slightly less sweaty than me. <laughs> and so, but, but definitely it makes a huge difference to the sound. Makes a huge difference to the And sound. what would be the giveaway for you when your strings need to be changed? A couple of things. How they feel is the most obvious one that everybody uh, notices, right? You pick up a guitar with old strings, you're like, whoa, that's crusty. That's other bands. Especially acoustic guitars, right? Like, just, that's, that's mine. But, <laughs> but obviously, the sound goes before you get the crustiness. And so, particularly, I notice, you know, when I'm going to record, I'll always chuck a new set of strings on there before I go because the difference is just so there's a, there's a life to them and a snap and pop. And do the strings not hold their? Do you find mm. the strings don't hold their tune as well as they age, or is that not so much an issue for you? Uh, it depends on the guitar, I think. Really, yeah, it is probably a principle that's true, but um, some guitars are better than others. Sure, like yeah. staying in tune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweet. Let's fly through these. Uh, pick up selection. Pretty obvious for, for electric guitarists, the closer to the neck, the warmer and perhaps a little softer you're going to get. The closer to the bridge, it's going to be more wild and, and gainy. And you can do so much dynamic changes on the guitar just by comp combining pickup selection and right hand attack. I don't need to delve into that too much. But uh, I'd love to know though, like how much of an average worship set mm. would you spend on neck versus bridge like where do you normally sit yeah i i sit on the neck for down moments and, and building moments and then big choruses i'm i'm flicking over to the bridge so most songs yeah you do a combination yeah yeah i would each song calls for a different style of of guitar playing we just started doing a song called echo by elevation worship um, and it's all neck pickup all the time because it's, it's got this synth, funk it? thing. It's, it's all synth, yeah, yeah it is. Um, that's probably why they're on the neck pickup all the time, you know. You know, it's all funky kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm just there, you know, the whole the whole song. But for your your big worship anthems and your big you know Bethel stuff, uh, I'm I'm jumping to there any time it's it's going yeah. up. Um, and so being sensitive with how much gain you're using is helpful for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you enjoy having mm. that breadth of... I love it. Yeah, yeah. Like how important do you think that is for an electric guitar? It's different of? for every player. Some people prefer to get all the changes here. But I love being able to go from... All the way to... You know... You know, pretty nuts without having to do anything here because it feels like I'm more alive and mature. It's like driving a manual car, you know, <laughs> rather than driving an automatic. Um, so I love it, but different guitarists prefer different things. Some people don't want to change anything here or here yeah. and they want this to do all the work. Yeah. Um, and it's not that one's wrong or one's right. It's just options. It's just options. Uh, I very rarely play with a volume pedal. So this is even kind of like, like novel because I'm, I'm constantly on this, on this all the time. And I can do the same thing. Here, whoops, I had my volume down. I do the same thing here as I can here. So, you know, I can be off rocking out with the drummer and doing my swells for some reason. Yeah. And you just did a gig with a guitar and an amp. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did, yeah. Add me on Facebook, you can check it out. Um, no, it was, we were, we were playing the Australia Day concert at Regatta Point and it was just crummy backline no time for setups or changes it's literally just plug in tune up you're playing and so there it was just guitar into amp the amp was uh so loud it hurt a little bit and then 
with this guitar, I could go from to a solo, but even more than okay, that because it was a vox and it was just off off chops, hanging. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's a, it's a thing. Yeah. Cool. Let's move on because I'm. I told my acoustic brothers that we could get something good for them. It's already 8.30. Um, pickup selection and then pedals. We'll come back to the pedal conversation because I've got some thoughts there. Acoustics. If you're an acoustic guitar player, give me a cheer. Yeah, sweet. We should have started with acoustic guitars. <laughs> um, I have a, a, a Taylor 414. It's nice. That's a required. It's thing. the Lord's yeah, anointed nice. guitar. <laughs> We all have all the acoustics, pretty much. Brilliant. We play regularly, yeah, almost. All have tailors. Yeah. yeah. Four one fours. Four one fours. It's just five, that right. Five, one, four, it's sorry. that right. Eight, five one four. Eight one four. Eight, one, four. Yeah. Whoa, we got a five one four in here, guys. Eight, eight, if you can lay hands on us all afterwards, <laughs> so you can just get a bit of that. Um, it's. I mean, if they're good guitars, man. They're just a good balance of like it's pricey enough to make you feel like you've got a real good guitar, but not so pricey that you have to sell your kids and your wife to buy it. Um, or that you get unnecessary mother of pearl on it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It really makes it sound better. Slap. Sick, oh, he's sick got an 814. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's devastating. No, mother pearl, mother pearl's great. <laughs> I mean, just some, some thoughts. Um, the wood's going to have a big... I mean, you've all got 4 on 4 so I don't need to evangelise guitars to you. Um, whether you want to cut away or not, you know, am I going to be up here or am I finger-picking all the time? Okay, cool, I don't need a cutaway. Darker woods are going to be way warmer than your spruce tops and, and your lighter woods. Um, and so cutaway is going to be a warmer full of sound and a darker wood is going to be a warmer full of sound. So if ever you're like, oh, just trebly, gross, tinny, and sure. Same thing with the strings. Thicker strings, warmer, thinner strings, easier to shred like Tommy Emmanuel, but um, slightly brighter. Yeah, you know. If you're ever playing that on Sunday morning, I'm moving to this church. <laughs> um, Pickup selection. Ooh, weird one. Weird, com weird, weird conversation to have. I'll tell you my journey with acoustic guitar pickups. I um, bought this guitar and it was kind of like my first adult steel string. I was so excited. I'm a big boy now. I've been playing this like crummy Yamaha that I bought for 400 bucks and or borrowing people's, you know, matins or whatever they had around the house. And I convinced myself upon buying it that it sounded great because I just spent two grand on it. I was like, this is a 414. It sounds awesome because if it doesn't sound awesome, I've wasted a lot of money. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I was telling people how good it sounded, I was convinced that it sounded really, really great, but then if I listened to the guitar in the studio, if I plugged it in, or if I spoke to our sound guy for any length of time, it, it quick, I quickly realised, okay, maybe this guitar doesn't sound as good as I thought it did, I don't know. I'd, be, I'd turn it up the bass, turn it down the treble, but then losing any definition or clarity, I'd go back, but then all of a sudden it just sounded like nice, you know, nails on a G string. Be a creepy horror movie. Um, and so. It's going to be a visual, I prefer not that. <laughs> I shouldn't have picked G string. Yeah. We'll, we'll edit that out. Um, <laughs> but I was I convinced. You, I was convinced that this guitar sounded great. Um, and and the, the, truth, the truth of it is if you buy an expensive guitar, unless you really know what to look for, it's an expensive piece of wood with a really cheap kind of piezo pickup in the bridge somewhere that they haven't spent a lot of money on. I mean, it's different from guitar to guitar. But if you go spend $1,200 on a, on a great guitar that sounds awesome acoustically, the quality of the pickup in there is going to be a bit bad. Like, it's just not, they're not putting the money into the pickup. Mm. Um, because they want you to pick it up in the music shop and have a strum and, oh, this sounds great. So that's where all their focus is. And when you take it on a gig to plug it in or bring it to church, it's like, oh, this is a bit... It's not the sound that I got when I was in the music shop, or it's not the sound that I got... If you ever work in a studio recording acoustic guitars, they're never plugging that, that bad boy in, right? They're always bringing a high-quality condenser mic in front of the guitar and miking it up, yeah? And so I would play on Sunday mornings, my acoustic guitar was never out the front of house, even when I was finger picking in quiet moments, <laughs> and I got real hurt and bitter about it. Um, and and I, I guess I kind of came to this place where I was like, okay, I need to pull out the 
original pickup and put something else in. So if you take a look at my tone controls where they would be on a 414, there's some nice black, black plugs in there. There's a new jack on the back here. And I've actually got inside the sound hole a condenser mic, just a tiny little baby condenser mic. It's called the Trinity system. And I have two very anointed, two little controls. One controls that condenser mic and one of them controls the bridge pickup. And so by controlling those two volumes, it's like all of a sudden I've got the life back into the guitar, like all the nuance, all the clarity, all the shimmer and sparkle is back. So it could be a cool thing if you don't own an acoustic guitar and you're looking to buy one, my recommendation is always buy a great sounding guitar, maybe even without a pickup, and then just spend 200 bucks and get a dope pickup in there. Um, the Trinity's really good, the LR Bags Anthem is really good, and it makes a world of difference. Like, you feel like Ed Sheeran because you tap on the guitar and it sounds like a kick drum. Like, uh, you're like, yeah! yeah. Which is just what your front of house guy wants on Sunday morning, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. know that, because we've had a few guitars that have had the microphones inside, and yeah. they can be ridiculously sensitive. Yeah. Really hard to EQ, and they just pick up yep. stuff. Like, mm. it's a bit of a sound nightmare. Yeah, that's scary. Especially prior to being on ears, when we would be using wedges. Oh boy! And the, yeah. There was just, the, the the headroom between good and feedback was tiny. Yeah. So do you ever have feedback issues? No, no. I'm pretty. I'm pretty lucky with this okay. system. That my suggestion in that case would be, and it depends on the pickup. But this one's got. Uh, I don't know if you can see it inside the sound hole, like a bunch of little pots that are adjustable with a small screwdriver. And actually sitting in the room, if you get the chance, and playing with the system and adjusting them so that you're minimalizing feedback, minimalizing the chance of it. So you go to your own off. EQ. Basically. Yeah, yeah. And so I kind of have sat in our church hall, plugged in, and yeah. then just fiddled. From until a front of house position. From a front of house position. Yeah, okay. Just straight until you then go to a gig or somewhere else. And then totally. And I'm playing with a roaring drummer and if, if if that's the case and I am at a, a, a gig it's rare for me I'm often on electric with a band um, on the gigs but if I am playing acoustic guitar on a gig I'll just completely just if I am running into that trouble just turn off the condenser mic and just use the piezo and I lose that wonderful sparkle that I was so excited about and spent 200 bucks on but it gets me gets me by and it just sounds like the old pickup used to really yeah. But what you're saying is, given the choice, you'd prefer to not just be relying on a piezo pickup in an acoustic guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds way better to my ears, but yeah. you can kind of have a play around with it. And, you know, we've sat at church, we've compared this to yeah. the standard Taylor Expression system and yeah. gone, oh, okay, cool. Made all the other guitarists yeah. feel jealous. Plug it in. And... Yeah, we could do it. We could do a test yeah. later on. It's going to be hilarious if we do a blind test and it's like, the <laughs> ES system's better, Chris. So, yeah. so, so you've got a new, obviously, the microphone system there, but the mm -hmm. bridge pickup you're talking about, is that... Yeah, that was, that was a new one as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. two separate. Yeah. yeah, and then you can control them. And this is actually a stereo jack. So to nerd out a little bit, you can awesome. take a stereo cable out split. and then split them and send one through a preamp and the other through a, a reverb and then sum them and just do all kinds of crazy nerdy things. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. But it's a, it's a thought. If you haven't got an acoustic guitar and you're going to buy one, maybe check it out. Mm -hmm. Hit me up. Uh, pick or finger picking, obviously that's going to have a big change on your tone uh, and we will talk more about that later on. And then your gear. Maybe get a, a good sounding acoustic DI. I'm not sure what you guys have here at Vision, but our DIs just don't sound great, especially if you get stuck with the Behringer Silver one. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> we so. had the DI 100s, but we now have some radial DIs. And... Woo-hoo! <laughs> nice. You don't have to buy your own radial. Um, that's a win. Maybe a verb or maybe have a conversation with your sound guys to, okay, cool, like, do I need this? Do I not need this? Are you doing it? Is it just going to sound bad? Learn to love your sound guys. <laughs> cool. Um, sweet, let's power on before we run out of time because my ability to talk is yeah. significant. <laughs> significant. A few steps to great tone for electric guitarists, just quickly, just some thoughts from Chris. EQ, start there. Get your guitar sounding good by itself, no pedals, no issues. Um, pretty much even across, across everything, nothing sticking out too much, not super thwompy and low, not piercing. And then 
think about maybe using a little less low end, and I'm talking minute amounts here, and a bit more high end for a big soaring lead sound that kind of sticks out in front of the band. Have Something you tried like that on a telly before. Yeah. Very bright. Yeah, very bright, and it's so it's totally guitar specific, right? On a telly. It's the other extreme. It's, it's not. It's down. not advised. Roll it off, roll it's it so off. not advised. <laughs> Um, everything how, just how would like you twang. handle that, Chris? Because obviously, we, we predominantly play tellies. Here, okay, cool. And we're awesome. currently struggling with trying to find a way to just tame that shrillness of the bridge pickup. Yeah. Um, yeah. But without kind of killing it. Yeah, yeah, no, um, yeah, just buy a strap. I'm joking. I'm joking. But on the other hand, yeah. we're having pretty good success with a Filtertron style guitar. Totally, totally. It's about, I mean, for, for, for a telly, at least, unless you want to sound like Keith Urban. I was at the Keith Urban gig the other night here in Canberra. It was a wild time. It's telly twang for days. Um, just plug the telly straight into the, into the amp, yeah, and get that bridge pickup somehow sounding great on its own. Before you touch anything else, before you even add a bit of drive, get your guitar at edge break up, where, you know, it's just at that point and go, cool, how can I get this guitar in this bridge position usable first? Actually, like, number one priority. And then go in and check your neck pickup and go, okay, cool, is this still, is this still working here? Yeah, it is. Cool. Awesome. Well, sometimes it's like, wow, now I've so significantly made a change to my bridge pickup sound that no longer, like, my neck pickup's just no longer yeah. working. Yeah. And if that's the case, then you're looking at your tone control and trying to find the sweet spot between amp changes and tone knob changes to get that bridge usable without totally ruining your neck pickup. Correct. And that's something that you can only do, you know, sitting in front of the amp for 10 minutes just to work out how it's going to do, how, how it's going to roll. Yeah. Do you, play, do you play tellies much? Yeah, I play tellies from time to time. My telly, my telly has TV Jones in it. Yeah. Yeah, but one of our one of our worship leaders plays an American telly, and he his is wired backwards for some reason. So I always pick it up and switch you know, switch forward, and it's like that yeah. bright, ah. it's that bright sound. And he he hates it. He's always having trouble with it. And so um, I just tell him to buy a strap <laughs> and run away. Um, yeah, you can buy some really great and and as in terms of a cheap option, buy some great cheap telly pickups online, you know, maybe spend a hundred bucks, but the smile on the face of your sound guy, worth every cent, <laughs> worth every cent. Yeah, good question. So EQ, drive, kind of have one level of gain and then a second level of gain, pretty ex self-explanatory, but without massively increasing your volume. We as guitarists love cranking our volume, especially as we load on gain, all of a sudden you've got bass, edge of breakup, Level one and then level two. And level two is like 10 dB louder than level one. We'll talk more about that in a sec. Uh, clarity, how much reverb or delay you use. Chris, rookie era, when I was growing up playing in church, I just threw reverb on everything. I had reverb in my kitchen sink when I was pouring myself a cup of tea. Like just verb city. And one day, a wonderful sound guy came up to me and said, hey, all that reverb Sounds really good to you, but at the front of here, when it's mixing with the pads, when we've got cymbal wash, when we've got vocalists that we're putting a bit of verb on, you're just getting lost. And, and that's what prompted me to think about this idea of clarity as a guitar tone technique. Clarity. How clear do I want what I'm playing to be? If I have more delay and more reverb, I'm losing clarity. And so the washier and washier it gets, the less discernible what I'm playing becomes, and it just sounds more and more ambient. I mean, it's pretty obvious. You turn the mix up to max on any reverb or delay, and you're not getting the sound of the guitar anymore. And so I find that often so many of our guitarists at Eternity, no one here, I'm sure, some of our guitarists at Eternity, and if you ever see this, you know who you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just crank the reverb, and sometimes it's because we're a little bit scared or maybe we haven't quite practiced enough. Crank the reverb to cover up any little, you know, those first two concepts that we talked about, left hand or right hand issues. Uh, and front of house can just do nothing. 
could just do nothing with it. So always think about, okay, the part that I'm playing, how clear does it need to be to be effective? Mm. And then the last one is evenness. How consistent is our volume? This thought process of changing tone, like we've been doing a little bit here, rather than your overall volume between gain stages, uh, I find front of house guys really love that. Maybe chucking a compressor on, um, either at the end or at the start, could be a helpful thing for that. Um, but, but just, you know, making sure that your drive pedal isn't 10 dB louder than everything else. Some, you know, some front of house guys want you to really turn up just so they don't have to active mix you if they don't know the song well and they know there's a guitar feature mm. coming up. But Joel, would you say evenness and consistency is preferable? I think it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's been another advantage, I think, Chris, of running the amp hotter is that you don't get the massive jumps in output volume yeah, when, totally. it's satura when the amp's yep. saturating a bit more. So yeah. I think that that's helped. That's helped. Right. There's a bit of natural compression coming from the amp. Yeah. But yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Sweet. Trying, trying to keep it fairly consistent in terms of what you're giving the sound card. Totally. Yeah, cool. And that's often pedal, pedal tweaks. Oh, this distortion sounds great. It's going to absolutely crank. <laughs> cool. Some things to try. We're not going to run through all of these, but this is just if you're stuck for tone ideas. Clean tone, I, and, and none of this is the rule, it's just a suggestion. Clean tone. I love quarter note delay, fairly heavy mix, short decay. If you're not an electric guitarist, don't fret about not understanding this. Where you can hear the first repeat of the delay, but the rest of them are dying off. Hmm. Kind of mild plate reverb. Short decay, mild mix, the amp just breaking up like we've got it here when you dig in and a compressor on to keep stuff consistent for playing clean lines. A rhythm tone, light overdrive, I'm looking for clarity, I don't want it to get muddy. If I'm playing lead, I'm going to gain up, but I'm not going to use the same level of gains for lead playing as I am rhythm playing, right? So at the moment, this is my clean tone. That's pretty solid for, for a rhythm guitar, like it's, it's drivey, right? If I'm playing... Yeah, I wouldn't want to go much heavier than that. And not a huge amount of verb, otherwise I'm no longer being clear. Verb's great for long-held notes where I'm just playing one thing that I want to ring out, but not so much for rhythm. Uh, a lead tone, a little bit of verb, pretty heavy drive, but to be careful on the heavy verb, we've already talked about that because of clarity. And what I'll do is I will, basically in terms of setting drive pedals, we went very quickly running out of time, crank up the drive to where I want it and then adjust EQ so that it sounds full but not harsh. And I will opt a little bit brighter the more drive we're going, but I'm not playing the telly all the time. <laughs> Super lead, just an idea, just, just more, just more gain. If I'm playing like one note or just a few notes, then I'll you know, I might use that 3% of the time, like very minimally, you know, just like holding nothing back. Holding nothing back is a classic example where, like you try and play that with not enough gain and it's like, it just sounds <laughs> gross and dorky. Totally great, great example. Push tone, um, lots of reverb, two drive pedals, very dark on the tone knobs and fading in with the volume pedal. Just give it a shot if you're an electric guitarist. Like cool push tone, like swelling in. With a lot of verb and very dark mm. distortion. It sounds sick. Mm. We don't have time. Maybe at the end I'll demo it. Razor tone and spank tone. Just some fun stuff that you can try. Just to experiment. Have a bit of fun with that. Sweet. Any questions on tone before we move on? Nah. Awesome. All right, cool. Last question, how can we steward spontaneous worship moments? Well, I've never been to, to Vision on a Sunday morning service, which is a real bummer, but I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a willingness to sensitively respond to the presence of God in the room. Absolutely. What a marvellous thing that we so need in church. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna preach at you. Um, but my goodness, like you guys are so blessed to be in a place that values the presence of God and stewarding moments and being sensitive to what he's doing. And Lord, you know, we're not just going to crank on with our set list if you're here and you're moving and you're touching people. So how can we sensitively steward 
moments of worship as guitarists. And that seems to be an emphasis point for you. It's, it's a, a greater and greater emphasis point for us and something that I love. Um, I've written this, let's be guitarists who know what to play or what not to play when God is moving. And I'm going to give you a, a scriptural example. I'm sure you, you should, sure you know it. It's out of 1 Samuel 16 and you can read it. But Saul is being tormented by an evil spirit and he goes, Oi, let's get David, right? David rocks up. He knows just what to do to play to bring soil, not soil, to bring Saul, right, some comfort. And um, I'm not going to read the whole story because I'm sure you know it, but it says this whenever the Spirit from God came onto Saul, that thing that would torment him, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul, he would feel better, and the evil, evil spirit would leave him. And you, you get this picture of David, right? It's biblical guitarist, Mr. Liar. L Y R E P. Um, right? But he has an understanding of what it means to shift atmospheres and what it, what it means to, to steward well moments, but also to know how to play to bring breakthrough. One of the things I've been talking a little bit to all our team guys is like, okay, like, what does it sound like? What does what's breakthrough sound like? What does peace sound like? What does joy sound like? If God's doing something in a moment, I don't want to be hamstrung by my ability to not be able to go with it or not be able to support it. And so beginning to think on the guitar, okay, like, what, what, does, this, what does this sound like? If God's releasing joy, how can I help that you know there are some wild moments in church where i've just just busted out in stuff that i would never normally play because god's releasing joy right whereas if god's bringing peace and there's this beautiful sailor stillness moment uh ego filled chris isn't shredding mad solos you know in those in those sections um, so I've, I've written this spontaneous moments it doesn't equal time to improvise. But then also next to it, spontaneous moments doesn't necessarily equal playing the parts. I'm talking for guitarists, right? The nature of spontaneous moments means, you know, someone is being spontaneous and improvising. But as a guitarist, they don't necessarily equal either of those things only. It's not like always when I'm, I'm in a moment with the Lord, I'm going to improvise as an electric guitarist. But it doesn't mean I'm just going to recycle the same thing that I've been playing for the last section. Stewarding moments is all about sensitivity to the presence of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in the room. There's this cool verse in Amos that demonstrates, and we don't know if when he went and played for Saul, it was, you know, God had spoken to him beforehand and he practiced his evil spirit casting out guitar riffs, right? Like, evil spirits go, you know. Like, we don't know if it was pre-planned or rehearsed, but we do know that he could improvise. This verse out of Amos says you improvise songs on the harp like David and invent your own musical instruments. If you read the, the wider chapter of the book of Amos, where that it's actually a curse on a bunch of people that are doing the wrong thing. But it gives us a really interesting glimpse. Oh, David could improvise. Wow. Okay, cool. David had an ability to sense what the Lord was doing in moments and to musically reflect that in new ways. And I love that thought process. So... If you feel like God is leading you to, to play what you've been playing the whole time, awesome. Go right ahead. Do it. It's probably going to work really well. But if you have decided to improvise or feel led by the Spirit to improvise, then I'd encourage you to, to think about these questions. What is the purpose of me improvising? Okay. Is it a feature thing and a melodic thing? Right. There are some moments where an instrument will just begin to play and it does something that a spontaneous song with lyrics just can't just can't do right there's sometimes when you might improvise and it be in the background supporting a spontaneous song or it might be driven by ego it might just be like i've decided to improvise you're gonna hear me improvise <laughs> right but not even just like shredding electric guitars right i've been totally guilty of like soft still worship moments where i go oh it's gonna sound so good if i play some sweet acoustic guitar finger-picking trickery thing that I haven't played and it's just going to be oh five people fall over on the power of the whole world 
Right. Right, but it's so distracting. It's not actually being sensitive to what God's doing. Right? It's balance. It's, I want to look good. I'm only putting that on the list, not because you guys are guilty of it. I have no pre-knowledge. It's because I've been guilty of it. (laughs) But another thought when it comes to improvising is, what can I sing or hum to myself over these chords that are going on if I'm going to improvise? And this is true as well for acoustic guitarists. What can I hear in my head? Because that's going to be more melodic than just the shapes and the patterns that we fall into as guitarists. Um, When you sing or you hum something to yourself over a chord progression, it's generally going to fit really nicely with those chords. You're not going to sing any notes that don't work, right? If I'm, if I'm playing in the key of C, I'm really, I'm not going to sing C sharp, right? I'm not going to hear that in my head. Right? But my guitarist brain might land on that, that note. Um, so, so, I mean, you listen to B.B. King. Has anyone listened to B.B. King? Great blues guitarist. There are guys that can shred all over him. But he has a way of playing one note. Honestly, you're just like, far out, right? Right? Minimalist, but brilliant. But he brilliant. sings as he plays, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Like he sings oh, the note as so he plays. So often, yeah. Another cool one, if you're interested in the jazz space, is George Benson. Yeah, I was just thinking of George Benson. Oh, man. And he'll do that. Uh, and it's just like, it's amazing because it's so lyrical and melodic. And those kinds of phrases, I'm not suggesting we play that on a Sunday morning. But something you can sing will be way better than your sweet minor p- pentatonic runs up and down. <laughs> Which was me. I mean, I'm, I'm still guilty of doing that. I'm preaching to myself as preachers. Because would say. it gets you, gets you away from shapes. It gets you away from shapes. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have a quick look at what we can do under that. But yeah, what's the progression? You won't hum or sing something that doesn't sit well with the chords. Mm. One, three, and five of each chord. And we can talk more about that later if you don't know what those numbers are. We'll sit well over the chords. So if I'm playing C, the first note, the third note, and the fifth, C, E, G, will all sit over that chord really nicely. Any of the other notes will create tension, yeah? In some way. And then moving back to those notes will create release. It's not saying don't play the other notes, but it's realize the effect that you're having when you're improvising. If I play a high F over that C chord, which is the four, right? It really wants to come down. That's the whole sus chord concept, right? But if, if I'm hitting that F note really high and everyone else is playing C, I better have a plan as to, okay, I'm going to resolve it eventually and not just play that one note. Chris's number one tip to improvising. Here it comes. It's a big one. It might scare a few of you. It's just learn how to play the major scale in every key all up and down the fretboard. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm in the key of G, I can play. But I can also play here. I can play here. I can play it up here. I can play it anywhere because then I'm not limited to where my, my, my feet may fail, where my fingers land. <laughs> but that's a real, that's like a, that's a, that's a tough, that's a big ask on a, on a Thursday night guitar workshop. Um, if you can't do that, everyone you know, has busy lives, I'd encourage you to, to be able to do it. But a couple of these shapes that I've written up are great start points. The very first one that's tabbed out is a starting point. It's a basis point. Do you want to do this? Just attend to my go for it. The start one is is the basis point for a potential improv. And then I've adjusted the notes ever so slightly on the following three shapes to give you note selection options that are going to work around that shape. So that they're all C and they're fitting in with the caged system. If you're not aware of the cage system, we can probably chat a little bit more later. But C, A, G, D, caged system. Um, So this first one. All options. If I'm picking through, I can use any of those notes in uh, in a spontaneous moment. On electric guitar, on acoustic guitar, I can be picking through them. Yeah? 
I'll quickly demo the other ones, but just give it a shot. They're all in C. Up here. There are those notes. And they're great for little arpeggiated lines, you know. Just change a little bit. It's classic, write your own church worship guitar riff for dummies. Or up here is that last one. Yeah, just, just playing around there. And you can arpeggiate them like I'm doing. You can just play one. Yeah, but obviously having that major scale awareness will, will help you. But they're all based around kind of sus2 and sus4 concepts. And they're a really good all, place to start. All of those examples were C chords. Yeah. Just played in different positions on the neck. Yeah, totally. Got it. Totally. Uh, and obviously on electric guitar they're going to work differently to acoustic guitar. Note selection, hugely important, obviously. The order in which you play notes, hugely important. Legato, so hammering on and, and pulling off will change the sound. These are all things you can consider when improvising in a moment. Why? To match what God is releasing, what the Lord is doing. Okay, what's peace sound like? What's joy sound like? Maybe you're going to use some of these techniques, slides and bends, and, and velocity, you know, how hard are we hitting those? And similarly, we talked a little bit earlier about those finger picking moments, those sailor moments, just amazing. Some of my favorite moments in, in worship. And so if you can expand your chord vocabulary, if you want, I will literally email you just a million and one chords. In the key of G, in the key of E, in the key of C, great guitar chords that we don't normally use to kind of expand what you're doing uh, and, and finger picking exercises that are going to help those those moments um, but you're starting with sus2 and sus4 so just got that just that G bass note and some open strings there's the sus2 Offs. Probably using them more than I would in a worship moment just to demonstrate them. It just carries something. And so expanding your chord vocabulary, open strings sound amazing, hammer-ons and pull-offs. Yeah, if you do too much of it, it gets awful country. But, you know, you can hear tastefully those moments just pop out. Use a capo if you want. Um, G shapes are really great. Open strings are the bomb on acoustic guitars. E shapes are really good, you know. D string sounded bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah or, or whatever progression you, you, you're playing. Some hammer ons, some pull offs, some slides, and some new shapes. It's also that you're playing with your fingers with your right hand. Also, yeah. Fingers are making a huge difference. Huge difference. <laughs> right, it's just different. As soon as you use your fingers, everything's warmer. Everything's way more, way more mellow. And those notes really start to pop out a bit. And so having some finger picking patterns that you can practice where you're alternating between thumb and your other four fingers. Uh, so, you know, one, 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 you can just see that thumb's always going if the moment calls for it, right? right. Or if, if God's, you know, doing something and bringing joy. Or I'm changing my finger picking. If it's a real still moment, I might not constantly repeat that bass to give the movement. It's the most anointed thing I've played all night.
right? Like it's just it's about okay, God, what are you doing before I play anything? You know, we're just like you know, we read in the Bible. I don't want to go there if your presence isn't there. It's kind of I don't want to play this unless your presence isn't on it. And as a worship leader, it's it's a great thing to be able to do. You know, you see Brian and Jen Johnson lead all the time, and Brian just goes off on these wild acoustic guitar journeys. And it's awesome. It carries, it carries something. And as you begin to play, often you'll spark something in someone else, and they will perhaps begin to lead and take the service somewhere where it wouldn't have gone if you hadn't played what, what you were playing. Yeah. Any questions around that? So as far as getting like different finger picking combinations, is it pretty much just a matter of just practicing them? Or totally. Like, yeah. 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 Is there like set ones that you? I would start with with two. I would just go. If you do, you finger pick much or? Not a whole lot. Awesome. So I would I would recommend you start with two. Just just take it up and down, right? I would sit there as a kid. Just, Right, and then you take that to the guitar. Um, chucking your wrist on the bridge can often be a really helpful thing if you're learning finger picking for the first time, because you can familiarise yourself with with the position. And then pick some strings, and not even fretting, just just do that. Yeah, up and down. That's six eight. If you have a listen to it, one two three four five six. One two three four five six. Yeah, for a four four version, just one two three four one two three. Just going up. And starting there. Cool. Can I do this over all the chords? It carries weight, right? So much more than perhaps. Um, so starting there, and then work at thumb, finger, thumb, finger, thumb, finger, thumb, finger, thumb, finger. So let's start slow. A slide and a pull up there. Uh, couldn't help myself. So yeah, and then doing this. Yeah, I've, I mean I have stacks more. Um, growing up as a kid, like the person I already mentioned him earlier that sparked this for me was Tommy Emmanuel. And Tommy so often talks about amazing guitarists. If he's ever in Canberra and you don't go to the gig, like, you're missing out. Was, he would talk. I saw him years ago. I was, it's the only guy I've seen play a lead rhythm and a bass or the one guitar at the one time. Yeah, yeah exactly. And he, he and he, he does the. You know, um, and this so inspired me as a, as a kid where he'd start with a walking bass line. And I remember watching a YouTube instructional video where he's like, just do that for like six hours a day for three months. <laughs> <laughs> right, just bouncing your thumb between some strings and then you add a chord hit with the other. And then if you get really comfortable with that, then you add a melody, which is... This is taken back. It's been a while. Right, something like that. Or he does it with Blue Moon, which is an old jazz standard. Like... Right, start with the bass line. Add some percussive hits. And then a melody. Oh, this is a bit rough. <laughs> and I, I would just play these kinds of tunes like constantly. That's not really going to be super necessary from a church context. But in terms of giving your thumb a brain and then the other fingers to be able to do something different, it's awesome. So if, it, if ever you just want to sit there and just... Just get your thumb doing that and then... Right? If you push yourself to that extreme, when you come back to... Oh, in a worship service, it's just going to work so much better. It's almost like I've forced myself to run a kilometre. So if I try and do a hundred metres, easy, easy, easy. Yeah. Great I think, question. I think I think I think probably every single one of us would agree that finger style acoustic guitar is such a great fit for worship. Mm. Like mm. You, you could like you just started playing four chords, finger style acoustic guitar. 
and that's 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 beautiful. Mm. And it's a it's just such a good fit for worship music. Yeah, I just think we could probably try to do a bit more of it. Mm. It really yeah. takes you somewhere, doesn't it? It takes you somewhere. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, totally. It really does. Totally. How many of you guys worship lead? So just yep, yep, yep. Yeah, cool, awesome, great worship leading tool. Far out. Awesome, awesome, to be able to, to to lead a song, and and it's not just even restricted to the down moments or the, um, you know, the really quiet songs. I'm not sure where I've put my capo. I'm gonna steal someone else's. Thank you to whoever supplied this G7 capo. She's in a good brand. Um, you know, even like we were talking Lion and the Lamb earlier. Yeah, that bridge section. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Like that, just right. A little down section in a song. The rest of the time, you... yeah. But if you've got a sound guy that can can bring that in, suddenly the emphasis point, the focus of that that section has a different kind of weight, different change. So being able to do it, yeah, great, great. Rather than who can stop the Lord Almighty, you know, it's still great, but it's different. Mm. Sweet, how are we doing on time? Nine oh six, nine oh six. Cool. Well, that's pretty much everything handout wise. I'm impressed that we managed to cover it all. Oh, we were flying. Any questions? Any thoughts? Even just comments, just general comments. You're amazing to start with. <laughs> no. We're just like sitting in awe. That's very kind. The points you bring up are, are great. They're really, really good. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So not only are you really skilled, but the way you presented it is all stuff that I think is oh, very, very useful. I'm so watch. glad. That's great yeah. to hear. So you talked about um, having finger finger picking stuff and chord progression stuff, which I assume is about the cage things yeah I'd really appreciate that kind of stuff awesome. but generally like is there a is there a plan that I can sort of map out yeah of, of acquiring these skills like a like a particular program or a book or that kind of stuff yeah that's or, a great like, question you've got this whole bunch of stuff yeah. it's almost like where do I get where do I start how, how do I how do I visualize my way through this I suppose um, prioritizing based on what you're going to use the most would be my thought I could recommend a program or something, but but really they're all going to be different. So you you play acoustic and a bit of bass, was it? Yeah. Do you sing or just play acoustic? You sing as well. Yeah. So so maybe the learning the major scale over the entire fretboard thing isn't going to be super helpful, right? Being able to to, to pick melodies, it's not gonna it's not gonna really do you much good. Yeah. Who knows? Joel may crank it on the front of the house. <laughs> what do you do? But so so I would say chord vocabulary and finger picking. Awesome, awesome. And if you feel like you've conquered that to where, okay, cool, if God's doing something in a moment, I know how to steward it. Mm. Brilliant. Then maybe you look at, okay, what can I do strumming-wise, my strumming patterns. But they'd be the two places that I'd start. And I'll, if you, I'll give me your email afterwards and I'll give you just a wealth of chords. Yeah. But particularly for us guitarists that love capos, and I love capos, right? Capos get a bad rap. Amen. Everyone's like, uh, the capo, you're only using it because you can't play bar chords. Yeah, right? Which sometimes is true and it hurts. And? But if you listen to this, right? Okay, bar chord. And I chuck the capo on. Have a listen to this. Okay, so I played the bar chord really well. There isn't as much of a difference as I was hoping. Right? But changing versus it's just not the same you can't tell me that it sounds better you can't um, so the chord shapes that I will send you probably for the key of G yep. the key of E really great capo keys because we have so many open strings and that's the advantage of open strings sound lovely and so just starting there maybe a couple in the key of C um, some 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 ones that I've just been fiddling with recently. So like we all probably in the key of G have played G, yeah, C, and then you slide up the C to D. 
Yeah, yeah and we've probably all played where you keep these two fingers up the top and you. <laughs> Blessed be the day by the Lord. Yeah, but um, a really fun one is if you take, uh, if, we're, if we're playing C and we're, we're thinking about that sliding concept, if you double the fifth in the bass, you turn, turn into a, minor, a, a major seven instead of just a normal chord. So C, C major seven, double the fifth in the bass. All of a sudden, it's a different sound, right? Yeah? Oh, what if we take that fifth and we also chuck it on the top, right? Right? Totally different emotive thing to just yeah and so even just simple stuff like that where you just pull a note out you chuck it somewhere else and you Actually, I need to practice those because I can't do them without looking oh why would I play B minor in the key of G like right in a moment when I could play oh that's so nice so they're really good. And then same for the key of E, you know. Oh, just, that's nice. So finger picking chord vocabulary. Sorry to talk for three and a half minutes for a simple question with two answers. Anyone else? Any other questions? Chris, is it possible to do your best mm. to talk for two minutes about the moment you're in G, yep. you're doing like a mid-tempo kind of song, yep. you're going to do an instrumental go through the chorus chords coming out of a big chorus, yep. it's one, four, six, four. Yep. What are you thinking at that point? On electric? On electric, on awesome. lead. Like, is there some way in two minutes that you could go, alright, I've got to make these choices, and yep. this is how I'm going to think about it. And it's one, four, six, four, and it's pretty up, and you've got eight bars, before you go to a down bridge. Oh, I love it. And the worship leader turns with no warning and goes, goes give it to me. Give it to me. And you're like, <laughs> so We've all been what there. Are you what are you thinking? Like, awesome. in, like what, what would be the most important choices to get right at that moment? Great question. Great question. Um, yeah, I'll talk about it and then I'll demo it. A minute and a half of talking, 30 seconds of playing. <laughs> uh, so like around there? Sure. One. You know, it's just, it's just out of the up four, chorus. Yep. Yep, six minor. Yep. Oh. Yeah, there you go. There. Cool. So there it is. Um, let me just, I'll get a loop playing and then, and then we'll talk about it so that we can hear the chords in context. So here's the bass player and the, the drums and the rhythm guitarist. Cool. So there's our loop. Cool. You can hear the chords. You know, it's just a generic church song. Um, so, so I'm thinking, melodically, what can I hear in my head? Oh, I'm not hearing voices. What notes can I hear over the top of those, right? Yeah. G, the key of the song, works great over all of those. Have a listen to G. Right? It works over everything, yeah? Yeah. B is another great chord. Like G, B and D, one, three and five, are going to yeah. work perfectly. Of the root chord of the key. Of the root key. chord of the key. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can extrapolate that out to the yeah. other shapes. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking, what can I hear? And if I can hear it, it's going to sit well over the chords, right? And so if that's, if that's uh, let's just take that, that one example. Everybody here can hear G yeah. over those chords. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, can. Great. But that, with some attack, with some rhythmic variation, is a great instrumental break, right? So if I chuck on these bad boys, verbs are after verbs are delay, after. so let's do that. But... Right, right. Like, that's eighth notes, no variation. Poorly played, but it's driving and it's doing something. One note. Yeah. One note. I'm not launching into that. I'll tell you what I'm, I'm not doing is, okay, what scale are we in? We're in the key of G, so I'm going to play my G scale. Okay, three frets down, minor pentatonic. Okay. Right. Bass 
but it's what's going on around me. <laughs> it's on my... Yeah, sorry, go, no, no, going. no, no, please. Please. I'm not going to interrupt. What's, what's going on around me, <laughs> and how can I serve that, rather than just what I played, <laughs> which you all heard and loved that, right? Which was just boxy shape, boxy shape, la 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 la. Um, right? What? A, G. That's so out of tune, it hurts. Um, worked way better than... Yeah. Worked way better than what I was It, it almost before. shows you, you can, you, can, you can hold that G until mm. you're crying out for just a little variation at the mm. end of that chord progression. Totally. And then it means so much more. It means so much more. I, I could chuck a C up there or a B or switch to a different note. And that note that I switched to, because of my willingness to wait, carries so much more. Sure. Mm. Uh, and what's and informing that choice, though? What's informing your note choice? The note choice is, uh, okay, so what can I hear? Or if I can't hear, what do I know is going to work? Mm. Those G, the, the B, the D. And, and slowly beginning to train your ears to recognise melody and, and play it. So I might hear... <laughs> right? Let's just take that, okay? Can I... In a moment, work out what those notes are. I'm going to turn the tune off. Turn it down. Turn this off. Okay, cool. It's still fitting inside my box, yeah. but it's way more melodic. Na 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 na. Okay. Right. It's still fitting inside my box. I just displaced it by an octave, but that. That's going to sound way better. You can really hit anything in that minor pentatonic box, but if you hit it with some gravitas, if you, if you, if you really dig in, and obviously this is all this is all dry, um, so that the loop isn't being affected by the reverbs. But if I've got the verbs on, like you can get more of a picture with with um, oh no. I recorded, I uh, ruined my loop. How do you, uh, uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Do you want to play G, C, E, minor, C? Yeah, please. <laughs> Hook me up, man. Give me that church eighth note goodness. So really what you're saying, though, is you're starting with what you can hear in your mind's ear. Yeah. What you would sing if you were going to sing something. What would I sing? If I was going to invent a melody over this, why would I play something that I can't sing? Like, if I can't envision it, it's just going to sound like, I am a robot, I am a robot. That melody, somehow, God's created us to just, to, to know it and to hear it. So, yeah. I'll do the same now that you're cheating up and you've got me so. self-conscious. So, I'll take you through a couple of different stages of minimalism through to... Insanity. Does anyone need to go? Yeah, please go We're if you need to. Conscious of respecting I'm, yeah, I feel bad for us running well, over. Well, I asked the question. <laughs> um, does it, if, if, if anyone needs to go, of I course. so won't be offended. But so otherwise, yeah. yeah. We're just deep through all of it, right? Can you do just something like the, the last four? Yeah. Exactly. Right, so maybe I'm going to be a little bit more varied now. I'll go. All eighth notes. I'm not changing yeah. any rhythm. Um, but if if I was going to go even further than than that, then it's okay. Cool. Um, what techniques from the list that we have? That was just eighth notes. That was minor change of, of notes. But okay, how can I change my note selection? How can I change the order? What guitar techniques can I use? Well, let's do it again. One, two, three. <laughs> Wow. 
right? That's more, that's more, uh, what's the word? Improvisatory, traditional guitar stylings. But it's totally better, the, the pauses and the gaps and the waiting and da -da 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 -da, than if I just launched into one, two, three, four. <laughs> Like that doesn't. Where's the? What are you, what are you trying to say, man? Yeah. Um, yeah. Versus. And are those things just under your fingers, or are you really just? Um, yeah, they're they're so much under my fingers that they come to mind, I suppose. Yeah. 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 But that comes with. I mean, yeah, I was really lucky. I had a, a guitar teacher growing up that was just encouraging me to sing everything that I ever played. And um, that was so helpful, so helpful to me because you so quickly learn. If you do it, you so quickly learn to know what the note's going to be before you hit it. Prephonatory tuning is the scientific term. And it's our ability to hear a pitch within before we sing it. It's how singers pitch. Yeah? yeah. La, 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 la. Yeah, you don't just do that magically. Your 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 brain or your subconscious actually has an ability. Like if you think about the note la and go to sing it, but don't sing it. Your brain has this like weird moment where it's like, oh yeah, cool, I know where that is. Yeah, like go, go and try and sing it, and then stop yourself. You can feel everything set yeah, itself up. Yeah, it's, it's set up. It's absurd. It's crazy. God's mm. amazing. Mm. Um, it's like when we're actually doing vocals and doing harmonies, I could actually hear it in my head before I actually sing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's like, cool, let's do the same thing with the guitar. Mm. Can I ask one last thing just before we move on from that? Yeah, totally. What about if you don't want to do single note lead lines? So awesome. you're G, C, E minor, C, yep. but you want to do something um, more chordal, yep. but you want to get an octave or two above your acoustic guitar, yep. what's informing your choices then? Great question. So generally I won't play any more than two notes at a time, Anything more than that, it sounds a bit muddy. It's kind of like what we were talking about before. Even more so when you've got distortion, clarity, like, yeah, reverb, delays on. Um, so I'll play two notes at a time, and then I will adjust those two notes slightly to match where I hear the chords going. So I'll give you a quick example of that. And maybe, can you play, like, uh, one, four, six, four, and C instead? And I'll yeah. actually use some of the examples that are here on the sheets. Um, let's use the, the, the third one, 555, five, five, on the D, G, and B strings. Right? One, two, three, four. But I could even um, just use the two, right? So you're really sussing around on an A shape there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I can, I, I don't even, if I've got two notes down, I don't even need to just play eighth notes, but I could arpeggiate two, three, four. It's just so many options, so many options. So that's where I would start. And that's all caged. That's all caged. You're all sus yeah, sussing around C chords yeah. in different shapes. C, A. Would would people like to know more about caged? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Awesome, yeah. awesome, cool. Do you want to chat about it now, or uh, is no? It, I think that's too too big a thing. But just to, but just to say that what gives you the ability to instantly go. I really need to be somewhere near the 12th fret, or I want I want to be around 12, 14, 15. Yeah. So I'm gonna go to my D shape because I know it's a good, yeah. or whatever. Yep. And that's what gets you up above the rest of the band in that moment. Yeah, totally. Mm. So if you're shifting from sort of three to five, fret three to five, and you're yep. coming up to sort of 12 to 15. Yeah. Because you want to build it. Mm -hmm. You're just picking a different. I'm just picking a different shape within the cage system. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, it's easy to demonstrate in C because caged starts with C. So there's my C. C, A, okay. G, E, and, and D. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You can see that. I'll, I'll, I'll C, more cowboy chord version. A, G, E. e. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. And, and D up here. Yeah? yeah? So that's five different chord shapes yeah. to play a C chord in five different shape, uh, positions yeah. on the neck. And it continues on past there, obviously, right? D, C, We go back to A, C, we cycle back around. It keeps going up. Yeah. And you can do that in any key. Um, so if we're in the key of, of D flat, because our worship leaders hate us. Um, <laughs> right. So capo one, there's C, and now we're in D flat. C, A, G, uh, after that is E, it's become so second knowledge, right? Or ingrained. There's the, the D chord. Yeah, so does everybody get that that's a D flat chord? Yeah. Played in five. Is in five, it? Yeah. yeah. D, D flat played in five different. Yeah. yeah. And that that's where the. That's a big part, I think, mm. of what we do in church. Yeah. Being able to move or get around the fretboard yep. and pick your octave. Yeah, totally. And as you learn what we discussed earlier, the major scale all up and down across the neck in every key, you begin to see. Okay, um, if I am uh, playing the major scale, let's forget the cap because it's going to be confusing. Um, here's the C major scale. You can probably play this pattern. Yeah? Yeah. I begin to recognise, okay, these are actually all based around the E shape, or actually all the notes in my E shape are in that major scale position. And if I learn how to play the C major scale, but up two frets. C D E Still the C major scale, I'm starting at a different fret. Oh, it's got all my D, all my D notes in. So you begin to see how the major scale and your cage shapes are together. Really, um, it's just, you got to explore that. And, uh, yeah, totally. Correct, correct. I just start in an easy key, start in G. Or, oh, cool, can I play in G everywhere? Awesome, I can. Yeah, can I play in A everywhere? So in terms of practical music theory, do you think mm. Caged would be one of the big ones for electric Yeah, guitar? Caged is awesome and Nashville is awesome. Nashville number system. Yep, yep. Do you guys use Nashville? Yeah, yeah cool. Crash on the floor just... every Sunday. <laughs> Sorry, John. So how often, like, or, yeah, do you, do you practice? Like, how long do you practice for each week? Might be a bit different now. I know that you're not like yeah. studying, but yeah. like, just to I guess give each of us an idea. Of yeah. What, um, I know you're playing gigs a lot. Yeah. That, so. so in case my uh, just obvious lack of social skills didn't make it immediately apparent, I was homeschooled for four or five years and started playing the guitar as this nerdy homeschool kid because uh, all my other homeschool friends were playing it, and I would just sit there playing it for like five or six hours a day in the early stages, and. Because it was like, you know, I finish all my, my school work and like work 7 a.m. till 11 and then just play guitar. Um, and then when I was at uni um, studying music, it was still kind of like three or four hours a day. It's way less now just because I don't have that time space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is real, a real shame. I'd, I'd be so good at guitar if I could practice that much. <laughs> and it's not that I can't practice that much. It's learning... Um, priorities, uh, you know, prioritizing other things like video games. Um, <laughs> Good exchange there, Chris. <laughs> and so uh, I was going to say my marriage, but then I was like, ah, oh, that's not true. <laughs> um, so, so now, um, yeah, way less. And it's a bit of a shame because all my practice is needs based rather than just to get better. You know, sure. oh, I need to learn this yeah, song for a gig. I need yeah. to learn this. You know, so we'll play we'll play like a, f a five hour call, and um, you know, four forty five minute sets pretty comfortably, and we'll have seven or eight new songs that clients are requesting that you find out on Saturday morning that you've got to play that night, and it's like okay, you know, then your practice is fueled by mm. I've got to get out with people to play this. Yeah, song. yeah, yeah. But one thing when it comes to practice and learning parts, I've found is if you sleep on it, you're way better at it. So like 10 minutes per day over a week, even with the finger picking stuff and the shape stuff, 10 minutes every day for a week, way better than an hour in one day. Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you so much for hanging. Later. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll can, pass it can, on. If, it yeah, we'll make it happen. Through, yeah, if you have any follow-up resources that you think... Yeah, totally. Like okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll make it happen. You send them to us and then we'll, yeah. we'll distribute it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Sorry so much for going over time, but oh, thanks no, for no, sticking around and hanging. And yeah, it's great. All right, are we done? Mm -hmm. I have additional questions, but I don't know if we have time. Well, feel free to fire them out if people want to leave. What about... Is it cool if we call it closed? Yeah. And then, are you happy just to stay for another 10 minutes? Yeah, totally. Totally happy. I'm happy to stay another hour. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Yes, thank you. Yeah, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I, hope, I hope it was yeah. helpful. Got it. Yeah.